Hey everyone, it's Norm Ferrar, aka The Beard Guy here, and welcome to another Lunch with Norm, the Amazon FBA and e commerce podcast. Lunch with Norm. Lunch with Norm. Lunch with Norm. All right. So on today's show, we're going to be talking about Amazon suspension trends and much more. Our guest is a former Amazonian who helps sellers communicate with Amazon to protect and save their businesses. After working for Amazon for many years, evaluating seller account performance and enforcing Amazon policies, he launched e-commerce Chris. He teaches sellers how to think like an Amazon, how to think like Amazon, protect their accounts and appeal listing restrictions and suspensions. And he's a returning guest, Chris McCabe. So we'll get to Chris in a second. Before I get to that, I just wanted to give a big shout out to our sponsor, Href, Hrefs Webmaster Tools. Looking for more than an Amazon seller? Looking to become more than an Am Amazon seller? Start increasing sales to your own website with the help of Hrefs. With their new, very advanced and easy to use, get this, free, SEO tool, Hrefs will help you launch inbound sales from your very own website with ease while you sit back, relax, and enjoy this podcast. Take control of your business and check out Href, H, Hrefs Webmaster Tools, that's a tongue full, at hrefs.com slash awt, that's A-H-R-E-F-S dot com slash awt. Okay, where is the man, the myth, the legend? Did you get another haircut? I did. I did. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, welcome. Welcome everyone to the show. It's going to be a good one. Uh, I can't wait. Also, happy Friday. Um, what are your plans for the weekend, everyone? Put them over in the comment sections. I know uh, today, especially this week, has been just crazy humid in Canada, or at least in uh, Toronto. It's been brutal, and I think we're going to get some thunderstorms. So hopefully my uh, Wi-Fi doesn't cut out. Um, but yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome Jessica Rabbit. Welcome Facebook user. I'll have to figure out who that is. But uh, we're going to have a great show today. We've got an awesome prize. So stick around for the Wheel of Kelsey. Uh, smash those like buttons if you haven't already. Um, share it out to anyone who has had problems with Amazon suspensions before in the past um, or just any Amazon FBA seller that you know that needs a little more help. Um, that We'd really appreciate it. Also, if you're looking for full episodes or uh, highlights, go over to our YouTube channel. That's Norman Ferrar. And or if you even search just Lunch with Norm, you'll be able to find everything as well. Check out our paid membership program for more bonus content. That is small group Q&A sessions with me and Norm. Um, we do social media lessons. We do uh, anything related to Amazon uh, and e-commerce, as well as we have special guest lessons too. So um, yeah, just go over to our Lunch with Norm website and click on the membership for more information about that. Uh, and welcome, Faye. That's who the Facebook user All right. is. So you know, you talked about that membership program, right? Well, the other thing that uh, members get is additional wheels of Kelsey, which what can I say? I that joined is, just yes. for that. Yeah, and and a mug and M and M's too. <laughs> oh, there we go. Them. Well, yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd go for the M and M's. Yeah. Okay, so if you do have any questions, just throw them over in the comments section. So sit back, relax, grab that cup of coffee, enjoy the show, and welcome back, Mister McCabe. Thank you for having me. I can't wait to see the wheel spin. Now I'm like focused on that. Oh, you haven't seen that. I have, but oh, I you have. Okay, again. all right, all right, all right. Again, it's uh. Maybe should I just describe it now? It's a free in-person ticket to the Seller Velocity Conference here in Boston. Oh, so, fantastic! Looking forward to seeing whoever wins that. Okay, that's a that's a great deal. And what we'll yeah. do is we'll we'll mention that a couple times throughout yeah. the episode. But uh, yeah. so that will be hashtag Wheel of Kelsey, and it's for your event. So why don't we just say that again? It is the conference that you're holding. Yep, it's our conference, the Seller Velocity Conference, September twenty third. It's an all day event here in Boston. Uh, got a whole range of speakers, um, some familiar faces, some maybe less familiar, but all experts in their various uh, fields and niches and areas of the industry. Um, we're excited about that. I'm excited about it because it's the first conference I'm doing here in Boston, which is my hometown. Um, I've always done things in Seattle, New York, 
other places. I'm right. looking to do one in Europe next year that I haven't put together because of what's going on in the world. But uh, yeah, if you're, so if you're in Europe <laughs> right now, uh, look forward to that. Maybe in France, I'm kind of looking at France for next year. But um, yeah, so free ticket today. Can't wait to see that wheel spin and see who who's going to join us on the 23rd. Fantastic. Okay. Yep. So Chris, for those people that don't know you, I, I think I covered most of it, but can you tell us a bit more about yourself and who you are? Yeah. And I just celebrated, I think my seventh anniversary as a consultant. So I've worked uh, as a consultant as many years as I worked at Amazon. When I was at Amazon, I was one of the people who was reviewing your account, maybe sending you a warning if things were bad enough, suspending the account, but then also, and also policy, enforcing policy violations deleting listings, what have you. Um, I, I was also on the appeals adjudi adjudication side. So reviewing appeals, accepting or rejecting them in terms of account reinstatement, which in those days, account suspensions were common, but they were not anything like today. Mm. And by the way, I'd like to hastily point out that the quality of the messaging Amazon sent out, while not perfect and maybe not fantastic, was 10 times better than the garbage they're sending you these days that, right. that says absolutely nothing. Um, I just, just before I got on with Norm, I just had a conversation with somebody, you know, almost every day people ask like, why is their communication so non-existent or so why is the messaging so terrible? Um, it's in their interest not to kind of have you pin them down on things they say just in case they're wrong. So maybe that's the quickest way of answering that. They'd rather have it as murky as possible, obviously for legal liability reasons. If they think you're coming back with an arbitration case, which arbitration cases are kind of piling up right now too, right? Um, but they don't want you to be pigeonholing them in particular language that they put in a message. So they make it as murky as possible deliberately. It's not like an accident. It's, you know, you haven't sent us sufficient information. We're lacking sufficient details. Like they don't specify exactly what they think you're missing. Um, I mean, some of it's kind of laziness and some of its convenience convenience for them but it's also to protect themselves in case you come back with you know you guys sent me a message that was zero percent correct <laughs> yeah you know yeah. i can see them protecting themselves but i wish yeah. they would like especially if there is some form of suppression you know yeah. just okay what is it and then you yeah. have to dig and you have to go through all these message boards and yep. or shouldn't say message boards anymore. It's like the old, um, what was it? The uh, BBSs back in the day. Like in 1988. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. The, post, the posting boards. Yeah, yeah that's it. So boards. I'm, I am aging myself. It's all right. More like the Facebook groups and trying to find out, you know, what's going on. And, you know, the one that happened recently uh, that, that well, one was the HTML mm -hmm. in your um, description, product description. Right. And the I other one was the upper case in your bullets and they hit people pretty hard with that they didn't they didn't used to care unless it was reported um by anybody i mean even yeah. buyers can be like this listing looks like crap and i'm buying this product all the time and they would still take action it's not just sellers reporting sellers but the the, the upc slash gs1 stuff started heating up where people using resold barcodes were seeing their listings taken down or suspended temporarily at least until yes until more info could be provided. And then alongside that, the style guide enforcement went way up in 2021. Um, maybe this kind of leads into what we're talking about today in terms of like essentially trying to prevent an account suspension in Q4, yep. more or less, not just suspension trends, but the trend all year has been a huge spike in individual ASIN enforcement and activity, right? Warnings, sometimes they don't suspend the listing, but they kind of hint that they might and they still want you to appeal. There's like a blinking, maybe not blinking, but in your head, it's blinking. Yeah. You're making it yeah. blink, even if it's not blinking. Appeal button that's like tempting you to hit it and say something, but on an ASIN level, right? Item authenticity, item condition. During the pandemic, there's been so much selling by just about everybody. I don't think Amazon tweaked their algorithms from two years ago before the COVID rolled in and sales spiked. I think everyone's still getting hit with these anecdotal complaints. So the more you sell, the more you're likely to have to deal with these on an, an appeals basis. And maybe that suited the world in 2018, 2019, but you know, Amazon can get with it a little bit, not start flagging so many things for what amount to like false positives or minor, minor condition complaints, occasional item defect. I mean, like everyone, I think Amazon's forgotten that every item that ships 
might occasionally have a defect mm -hmm. <laughs> or a packaging, like mm -hmm. a damage in transit issue. Um, the same with the inauthentic complaints. Like if you sell a certain amount of product, eventually you'll get someone who says, this is different from last time. It might not say fake or counterfeit, but this isn't matching the listing in some way. I mean, there's a lot of info on a detail page, right? Chris, I got a question about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. This came up the other day. So if you change the packaging, if you change the product to improve the product, yeah, I heard, I don't agree with this, maybe I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. you have to change the ASIN. Yeah, yeah. Is if that correct? There's a fundamental change to the product. Now the packaging, um, you're more likely to attract like an inauthentic complaint no, you can, you can update packaging. Are you talking about the product itself? Yeah, I'm talking, well, yeah. The, the question that came to me was, um, like, let's say that- If the product you, fundamentally changes, you're yeah. supposed to use a different, you know, you're talking about a different product at that point. Right, yeah. so like yeah. uh, for me with a bully stick, if I'm using um, a thicker, meatier bully stick, yeah. you know, so it's, a, it's new and improved. You're changing would, dimensions, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because they're try what they're trying to do is prevent people from going in and, and editing, you know, detail pages and key ways. It's one thing if you edit a detail page to emphasize dimensions, let's just say it's product dimensions of a product, um, to, to make it more accessible information to the buyer. But if you start changing what the product is, then that can be flagged. And also competitors might notice that you're doing that and mm -hmm. uh, flag you for PDP abuse or flag you for, you know, just report you. Um, in ways that Amazon will come back and say, this, this item's now different than described, it's different than what we have in FBA is different from what you've got on your detail page. So that's preemptive on Amazon's side. They're trying to prevent all these inauthentic or I different item complaints. All right, sorry I interrupted. I know you were No, going no, that's all right. I know that's kind of convoluted and confusing and, it, and it's not been well addressed by Amazon, but you know they rarely update policy pages or have enough adequate information. Um, what I'm seeing in terms of failed seller appeals is um, a lot of people are given those checklists, those boxes, and they're, they're kind of ticking too many of them saying like, well, I want to make sure you get the right one because I know if I say it was a quality control issue versus a defective packaging issue, they might just reject it out of hand. And that's true. And I understand some of that logic. The problem is if you just tick a bunch of boxes on the first go, and they're like rejecting it for another reason or they don't like the rest of your plan of action. Um, and I'm talking about the root causes boxes, by the way. So if anyone's unclear on what I'm referring to, but this is the plan of action part of the appeals process. Um, now sellers are starting to hear, oh, you can't appeal this again. Like we don't want you to keep appealing this. The first appeal you sent, you ticked too many boxes and maybe you still picked the wrong one or we don't think you understand what the right root cause is based on your the rest of your solutions in your plan of action and then they just shut down they start responding or they stop accepting appeals because you were over aggressive on the first attempt those are the types of asin level appeals mistakes that people are making that if you make that mistake especially more than once i mean that will negatively impact your um, internally they would say your risk score externally of course your account health your account health dashboard and that's why some people are starting to get these calls from account health reps right right you got 72 hours to appeal. It's because they failed on the ASIN level. So heading into Q4, I just want to make sure everyone understands that it's fine to be aggressive, but be like smart aggressive, not silly aggressive. Um, and some people are probably being stupid aggressive with like, oh, this is just a BS process. It's just robots anyway. I'm just going to race through it because I don't feel like writing a POA. It's like, that's, that's fine if you're only making that mistake on one listing and it's a listing you don't care about. But you know, it's going to negatively impact your account health and it might come back to haunt you. So I'm trying to dissuade people from, from that practice. All right. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about more trends that you're seeing yes. uh, going into uh, the fourth quarter. Yeah. Got to go back to the reviews abuse. I know we talked about this a bit last time, mm -hmm. um, but this time I've got very, very specific info and advice. Um, last time we spoke, which wasn't, you know, that maybe the beginning of the summer or spring, but um sellers were still getting reinstated without too much fuss and trouble maybe some cases were bad if you had three or four or five methods that were non-compliant they were you were using to get sales rank inflated you know i mean now there's lots of content in amazon's messaging about sales traffic inflation sales rank manipulation not just reviews abuse but 
generally speaking, a few months ago, we saw most people getting reinstated with a good plan of action. If they got stuck with a proper escalation, that's, that's no longer the case. I used to say, well, if you've been busted for it twice, they're not letting reoffenders get back on. And I'm sure I said that to you a few months ago. Mm -hmm. Now we see first time offenders. This is sort of the news. I don't know if this is new anymore, maybe two, one to two months on first time offenders are being told, don't appeal. You've got nowhere to go. Um, sometimes it's the first nature time. first time. Well, some of the people that we've talked to haven't been suspended for anything, not just for abuse abuse. They've never been suspended period. So for those people to be told there's no appeals path, even though they're getting all these messages from Amazon telling them how to appeal. And even though they call into account health reps and talk about how to write a plan of action all day long and getting all these different pointers and opinions. Um, there's a giant disconnect between the teams that are final wording or closing those appeals in terms of future appeals won't be read, won't be responded to giant gap between that team and the account health team that you're talking to when you call in, because you can't call in and talk to my former team, solid performance. They're, they're a closed door, but they right. give you account health reps as kind of a go between. The problem is there's a lot of misleading inaccurate information coming from account health reps. And some of them are very well-intentioned and well-meaning and they might actually have a point because they see on your account that the appeal has been rejected and there is no reason given. There are no annotations by the investigator. Um, but the rep at account health isn't quite understanding. It's crazy that you might have to explain this to them. They should know. It's kind of crazy that they don't understand that there's no annotations because the investigator thought that you're done, that there's no point reading your appeal and they didn't need to document why they weren't reading your appeal and they just resolved your appeal message contact and moved on. And of course, if they had a better internal auditing process, they should be pulling aside those investigators saying, no, you still need to say why you're not answering this person. I don't see, I never hear about that. I never see any evidence of that. What we do is hear from people who never hear a word, never yep. hear a peep. They think they're waiting for an appeal to be answered, but there's no answer coming. They have no idea. And when they call account health, I don't hear enough. I sit in on some of these calls, right? I don't hear enough account health reps saying, I don't think an answer is coming. I don't think there's a, a realistic chance. You've either been suspended for something too terrible, like reviews abuse, you know, Amazon's sick of it. They've warned everyone publicly, privately, whatever, and people still do it. So they're just tired of code of conduct violations. So that's the reason. Or you've appealed too many times with a subpar POA. And the account health reps are stringing you along with false hope. And I don't think sellers should, should have to sit and listen to that. So reviews abuse, there are some yeah. first time offenders that are being busted and they're having an extremely difficult time getting back. So I want to talk about this because yeah. there's so many people that I, you know, I, I'm not asking for reviews, but there's ways mm. that you don't have to ask but it's still manip manipulation. Right. And I wanted to go over some of those. You're, I mean, you, you, you've talked about this before, but yep. when, how, like if you get that nasty email talking about review manipulation. Like a violation warning. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to go out there and say, if you like this product, click here. If you don't like right. it, click here. Uh, it could be so many other reasons. Can we go over some of those? Well, maybe just we'll roll it back to the beginning and define some of our terms here, because there are still some people contacting us saying, you know, I only asked for an honest, unbiased review, or I didn't necessarily specifically cite that I wanted a positive review, but I gave product away. None of that matters anymore. We can debate whether or not it's clear in their policy pages. We can debate what's fair and what's not. But the bottom line is we see the enforcement trends every day with what we do. And there's no doubt left in my mind that they have made up their mind on how to enforce that. So the idea that you're asking for an unbiased review or an honest review, you're, you're back two, three years ago and you're right. too far behind the time. So let's throw those questions out first. It's not, it, it's not just about asking for a positive review anymore. And it probably hasn't been for 18 months. Even people who aren't asking for a review at all, are getting suspended for giveaways or are giving getting suspended for offering 100% rebates after the order because they're inducing certain kinds of behavior that trend tends to push people in the direction of positive and discourage negatives just like the phrasing you just mentioned right everyone knows you can't say 
and I still see inserts that say it, by the way, if you're yeah. happy with the experience, leave us a review. If you're not, call us, email us, whatever. I still see inserts like that to this day. But this is the equivalent without doing that, if that makes sense. You're still essentially considered to be asking, let's say not asking, prompting a review. And that review tends to be positive if you're giving away a product or putting in your sales funnel messaging that takes people to your website and on your website, again, even if you're not saying leave us a positive review, you're sending them to your Amazon page, you're giving giant discounts or giveaways um, that, that push people back to the Amazon space. I mean, this sounds unfair, but Amazon investigators are spending way more time tracking your traffic and trying to figure out what you're doing on Facebook. Usually it's just a competitor is showing the whole funnel to them and they don't have to spend time running it down and tracking it down because they don't, everyone knows they don't want to spend a lot of time on an individual case for anything, but they don't really have to, if somebody gives them your whole funnel and starts, you know, red line, you know, circling in red, this is a violation. This is a violation. I'm only saying this because people have shown me this stuff. You know, people contact us saying, I want to report my competitor. My competitor is inflating their sales, tra uh, their, their sales rank and their, and their traffic. And if they're not getting too many positive reviews, they're at least manipulating sales rank. And of course, now sales rank is a new area of focus. So you just have to be extremely conservative about this stuff, which not everyone wants to hear when they're launching a new product or when they're facing stiff Q4 competition. But I can't tell you how disappointed I am when people tell me we've only been suspended once for this. We got our hands slapped. We didn't adjust things in time. Some people just didn't pull their inventory out of FBA, like removal orders, because it was simply, and I understand why, but it was simply too costly to pull all the units that had non-compliant inserts. So they tried to sell through the inventory, but they had a warning before they sold through the inventory. And if anything, you're in a minefield already. If anything comes up before you sell through that inventory and you're busted, you're going to, you know, five or six times harder to get back up. Now you talked about inserts. Are there certain, we, we already talked about the, yep. the one old, old way of doing it. Yep. But what about, is there any other types of language on your insert that shouldn't be there? You know, yep. Oh, go to the, go to my website and get 15% off or, Anything like that, that you have to be careful of on an insert? Really anything that could, res I know this sounds kind of crazy, anything that could result in a surge of sales that would result in a corresponding spike in positive reviews is going to at least be reviewed. I'm not saying that results in a suspension, but they're at least going to look at it. Um, having five stars across the bottom or across the top is more or less universally considered a major no-no at mm -hmm. this point. It has been for a while. So, and I saw an insert like that yesterday. So I know they're still in people's packaging. Um, so get rid of those. Like maybe some investigators will look at it with an even head and they'll say, you know, I'm going to send a warning for this. They haven't been warned for it before. Maybe they'll think it's not a huge deal, but other investigators will not view it that way. And they will know that they've got their managers backing to be as aggressive and heavy handed and, punitive as possible because it's a very public issue now how Amazon's having a huge problem with product reviews. I mean, when did that blog post go up when they admitted that there was a product reviews problem? Of course, they blamed social media companies and not themselves. But um, wasn't that like two months ago or six weeks ago? Yeah, something like yeah. that. So that was kind of, to me, there's been all sorts of rumblings in the, in the in, in Amazon community spaces and in the public space. But I would say that is your definitive line. Go back to that date to where they publicly admitted there's a problem. That means they're on notice from that date forward, which is maybe six, seven weeks ago. Mm -hmm. That means the media or even government officials, maybe the FTC, we know they're always poking around the reviews space, especially with Amazon. That means Amazon's publicly putting themselves on notice for cleaning up the problem within a certain reasonable, let's say reasonable time frame. Um, that means the more headaches you create for them, the more likely they are to want to punish you for making their life miserable because they know it's going to come out somewhere publicly and, and they're incredibly concerned about the, the reputation of, and the, the appearance of the marketplace being as fair, honest, reliable as possible, right? 
So consider so, that, not just your own sales or your own competition. Consider Amazon's motivation to maybe take a minor thing that you've done and treat it like a major infraction. Right. Especially okay, so before. before we get to the next yeah. point, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to let anybody who's come on a little bit later about our giveaway today. Mm -hmm. Chris, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, and also it's going across the bottom of the screen. The the Norm Rocks code gets you 10% off with Ticket to Seller Velocity, whether it's a virtual ticket or in person. We're, we're doing both this year, just like we have every year. Um, but this time we're giving a free in-person ticket for the conference here in Boston on September 23rd to whichever name the wheel lands on, right? Oh, fantastic. So, yeah. so, so that's a full, um, you know, few hundred dollar value for in-person attendance of the live, the lightning talks and the live breakout sessions for here in Boston um, in the seaport, which is kind of Amazon land here. If you've been around Boston, uh, there's been a couple of events here in Boston already. I think there's going to be more Boston based Amazon events in the years to come. Some of them will probably be promoted by Amazon itself. Oh, great. Yeah. And that's just hashtag wheel of Kelsey. Mm -hmm. And if you want a second entry, it is uh, tag two people and mm -hmm. you'll get that second entry. Yeah. Okay, so let's keep going. So the review, this is very interesting. Okay, so what's next? I think the good news is the review stuff is extremely, to me, clear cut. It's not clear cut for people that don't understand suspensions of accounts and policy enforcement along these lines every day, the way we do. Um, but I've gone on, I don't know, this is my ninth or 10th podcast talking about this topic. Not that we don't save unique content for you, but um, <laughs> this is the first time I've said publicly that I think some first time offenders are never getting reinstated. And that concerns me to no end. Um, and that is the bad news. The good news is people are finding new ways. I mean, I can kind of pivot away from this dark cloud uh, topic to people are finding new ways to appeal when they're ignored or where, where Amazon just shuts them down and tunes them out. Um, I've heard that Twitter is back as a, as a way of getting their attention. People are tweeting S team executives, VPs, people that are publicly known. You don't necessarily have to spend all day on LinkedIn digging up names because yeah. you and I have talked about this before. There are some well-known names in the space who have been publicly interviewed on podcasts, writing the blog, um, interviewed about testifying in front of Congress, Lots of lots of reasons why the same four or five names keep uh, you know cropping up. Um, sometimes they're be, being quoted in books. I mean, sometimes it's that simple. So if you're reading the right books, you know who's who's who at Amazon. So uh, Twitter reaching out to them. Obviously, it's another way of getting their attention. Public way of getting their attention, not necessarily like an email, but they're delegating those tweets to their team, their crew to go through and see, hey, what happened with this? Did these guys fall through the cracks? Um, hopefully they're they're taking a fresh approach, not turning a blind eye, but you know, starting from scratch. When I worked at Amazon years ago, I was trained when I was doing those Bezos escalations, I was trained to go in with as much of an open mind as possible. And quite honestly, in those days at least, maybe it's different now, I was motivated to have an open mind and keep an open perspective when I looked at the at an escalation that came from Bezos's people because I knew if I botched it, it was my neck on the line, right? If I screwed it up and my boss or my boss's boss or one of Jeff's people thought that I reviewed things thoroughly and stated, you know, you're putting your name on it. Like I looked at this from every angle and I've decided this seller should stay closed or I argue that this seller should be reinstated and this decision was faulty and should be reversed. Either way, you couldn't really stay on the fence and be like, oh, I think this merits more scrutiny. I'm going to have my boss make decision. That was not a popular way to go. That's not how Amazon is. Um, your neck was on the line, right? You had to take a fresh perspective. These days, it's less common for them to insist upon that because there's so many escalations. They're drowning in them. But, you know, I don't know. Well, what it, about a... I know this stuff isn't easy, by the way. I know I say these things sometimes making it sound like this is just like pouring yourself a glass of water. I understand that it's complex, but I also understand that you have to go in with kind of a good solid baked in strategy before you put pen to paper or even before you make a decision on how to approach your appeals path. So yeah. from what I understand, from what I've, I believe is true, there is a buyer quality score and a mm -hmm. vendor quality score, seller quality score. Yeah. So if your seller quality score 
if you maintain a good quality score, mm -hmm. it, I would think it would be much easier to appeal. Is that correct? Um, depends on what you're appealing. I mean, all other things being equal, yes. Um, code of conduct violation, not just abuse or reviews of use. Code of conduct is a big, big thing at Amazon now. Mm -hmm. um, this actually started maybe 2019, 2020, where they came down from on high. Um, sellers who are willing, you know, whether it's out of ignorance or willingly bad faith pursuing abuse, this isn't going to be tolerated. So there are people who are years long sellers. You know, the common question we get is, but I've been selling for years. Does that help? Or I do 40 million a year. Does that help? We've seen sellers who've been selling for 10 years kicked off for code right. of conduct violations and they struggle to get back. Even if they've got a paid account manager, even if they have 800 grand that they owe in Amazon lending and Amazon wants their money, obviously. Um, the, how many years you've sold and how big your account is. Let's look at those massive Chinese accounts they took, took out in July. 50,000. I mean, I've heard estimates that it was about a billion in revenue or a billion in sales that they took away just in that purge. Maybe some of that, maybe some of that billion is the purge that's been going, going on since they took out those giant right. accounts in July. But there are a lot of Chinese accounts that are gone right now. It is not just those four or five. Um, there's clearly something up. And, and the other message isn't just that you can't get away with murder from China anymore. The other message is you can't be considering yourself protected if you sell 40, 50, 60 million. So if you can't consider yourself protected, then what about if you're doing way less than that and you're a smaller brand probably means when it comes to playing by the rules or liberally interpreting their rules to your own benefit based on your own favorable interpretation of the rules. Now is not the time to do that. At least let the, let the dust settle until we can continue to evaluate current trends for abuse, for reviews, abuse, obviously that's the easy one for product detail page manipulation. Let's go for another example for reporting, uh, unauthorized resellers on your listing, right? This is a topic that comes up now and again, I'm sure you've talked about it on this podcast. How many times? Yeah. Many, many people are getting blocked for submitting false counterfeit complaints against resellers it's so who, important oh my gosh yeah, who assume and this came up i don't know how many of your listeners were um i got a tip from one of our clients who went to an event in chicago um not tied to retail x or any it was a smaller event um one of the law firms that's well known for submitting counterfeit complaints against any reseller that hops on your listing whether or not there's a confirmed test buy whether or not there's definitive evidence and proof that they've counterfeited your product, they've been re reporting these anyway. They've been getting uh, their sell their clients blocked with for fake IP claims, for brand registry abuse, for abuse of the infringement system. I think a lot of their clients don't understand the Amazon implications or, nor the legal implications. They're just riding along with the party and, and trusting their attorneys. Fact check what your attorneys tell you about what they're advising you to do just the way you'd fact check a non-attorney like me advising you on Amazon appeals processes. I invite anyone to fact check any advice I tell them to do by getting a second opinion if they want. Definitely do it. Don't take it as take that word as gospel from your attorney either. There are good attorneys out there and bad attorneys out there. There are good account and nascent reinstatement consultants out there, and there is crap and garbage. I think we all agree on that. Be careful. Be careful. Don't just follow along, you know, because Amazon, what I'm building up to, I guess, is that Amazon holds you, the account holder, responsible for anything that happens on your account. You know, there are people who are getting suspended. Here's another one. Forged documentation, manipulated, edited invoices. Um, I don't know if that comes up a lot here in your group. Somewhere. Not really, but I so definitely much. heard of it. For sure. You've heard of it, though, because it's yeah. so widespread. Yeah. Well, obviously, it's easier to catch. They're more willing to enforce it. I mean, that's not an, a new topic that's been going on for a few years. But that is now, and maybe in the beginning was, if I remember correctly, a code of conduct violation, which means you can blame an employee all you want, but you as the account owner or manager, whatever, agency responsible for the account, if you're, if you're not the account, the business owner yourself, you are responsible for what happens on that account. 
the third party services you hire. There was just a big piece in the Wall Street Journal about a major third party services provider that was busted for getting inside info from, in, from employees inside Amazon, right? Obviously inducing uh, somebody to release that information in ways that they shouldn't. What if you hired that company? Does that make you look good in Amazon's eyes? Like you're the one who's responsible for that stuff, not anybody else. Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely crazy, especially when you talk about those um, crazy IP um, mm -hmm. you know, infringements. People don't because those are everywhere and they're yeah. a good weapon. I'm not saying it's not a good weapon on yeah. your competitor. Make sure you wield that weapon wisely and smartly and <laughs> accurately. <laughs> that's the, that's yeah. the key because not only could it backfire on Amazon, uh, that company that you're sending that cease and desist order to uh, could come back and bite you. You know, if they want to fight something, yeah. Um, from what I've heard from um, another attorney mm -hmm. is that if, if you're sending out, so the the old way of playing this was that you would send out a, a communication, uh, a cease and desist. And Project Zero came in and made it a little right. bit easier just to delete, you know, people off the account. Right, right. But Amazon's a free marketplace mm -hmm. and people have the ability to put up their listing. And there's a lot of people that don't understand that they're doing it wrong. It right. might be buying your product from a reseller, putting it up on Amazon, mm -hmm. and they might have the right to be able to do it, even though you're a brand owner, which is kind of, they, for us anyways, we tell people reseller agreements are everything. Mm -hmm. If you if you have a product in the marketplace, if you're selling to a distributor, you've got to have it in that reseller agreement that they're yep. not allowed to sell, or people that they sell to cannot sell on Amazon. Yeah. But even that, I've had a hassle trying to clear a lot of resellers off of this one brand I was working mm -hmm. with. Yeah. I mean, what's Amazon asking resellers for all the time now? Licensing agreements. Show us a copy of the licensing agreement. Show us a copy of a letter of authorization. Yeah. So I totally get that if you're a brand owner, I, I understand that you don't want all these people jumping on your listing saying they sell your product, but you've still got to confirm with a test buy that they're selling a counterfeit That's right. version of your product. You can't just make that assumption. I'm sure there's some people that make the assumption and scare that reseller off and they get yeah. away with it. And Maybe that happens a majority of the time. I mean, I don't have that kind of hard data, but that's a risk. If you're wrong and you're called on it, you've just risked your entire account, really. I mean, even if you get suspended and come back to Amazon and say, we're, we're never doing that again, we're not working with that attorney anymore. I mean, that's fine. I mean, people do get reinstated, but don't assume you can get reinstated. Don't assume you can get reinstated quickly in Q4 when Amazon, Amazon's already taking forever to review and answer appeals now. We're not even in the thick of Q4 yet. Imagine if you're dealing with that two months from now, you're never going to hear from those guys. Right. right. And it's really telling if a, like a law firm went on stage the other night and said, don't do this. Like we know you've hired us to do this for, before for you, or some of you have, um, like I said, it wasn't a giant event. It was a smaller event, but all the sellers in the room were told not to, not to hire them for that, at least temporarily. What does that tell you if they're steering that work away from them? Um, especially if they've got a history of taking as many, people who wanted to pay them as possible. It means that this is a big deal right now. It means right. abuse is a big deal. It means brand abuse is a big deal. Um, and even brand registry is kind of, this is sort of another thing I haven't really talked about publicly, but um, a woman named Stephanie Harris used to run brand registry inside Amazon. This isn't even something you would have found on her LinkedIn page because it was very you know, controversial. I think that a brand registry was being abused. People were being attacked in ways that you shouldn't be attacked if you're a private label brand and you're in brand registry, but people still had listing takedowns for stupid reasons, back end keyword abuse, whatever. Um, the way brand registry is being handled now, I think is in flux. I mean, I've heard a couple, I just got back from Seattle a couple of weeks ago, talked to some people who are like, yeah, I think there's some stuff. I don't know if it's until Q1, but there's some stuff coming down the pike to reorganize some of this because people aren't able to use a concept like brand exclusivity when you're the only one who can make async contributions, right? No one else should be able to make async contributions to your brand if you're in brand registry. It right. happens all the time. They haven't locked that stuff down. So whether or not they announce brand exclusivity as something you can widely appeal and apply for, um, keep talking about it, sellers, keep mentioning it to Amazonians as you confront them. Because brand registry, I think, this is kind of theory in a sense from what I've heard, but I think it's in a state of flux. And I think there's some fertile ground to plant some ideas like in the last 18 months, 
there's been a lot of chaos in brand registry and it doesn't really protect my brand the way it should. I'm looking to launch new SKUs. Um, I might be looking to sell my successful brand to an aggregator, bring that up too. Bring in some of these new themes because these are things that Amazon can't ignore. They certainly can't ignore brand abuse and brand attacks because those are rampant and constant and they shouldn't be uh, if their tools were effectively policed, but also the aggregator conversation. Amazon can't hide from the aggregators. They can't hide from the fact that brands are going to be selling to the aggregators. So um, keep bringing this stuff up. Uh, brand registry, I think, needs to be pushed. Maybe they're on the fence themselves. They need to be pushed onto that other side of you need to do more to protect us as a brand. Otherwise, you're costing yourself money in the SKUs that we can't launch because we're always dealing with attacks. Or we could be selling a brand to an aggregator, launching a new brand. You're costing yourself the money from that new brand we haven't even launched yet because we're still stuck mopping up the mess from all these attacks of buyer complaints of inauthentic item condition, fake product reviews. A lot of people are still bogged down in their brand that they could have sold by now. I mean, I don't know. I'd like to hear your opinion on that. Don't you think there are people out there that could have sold their brand in 2020 or earlier in 2021 moved on, launched another product, launched another brand, and they're just still dealing with the mess yeah. of their account. You know? Yeah, that's absolutely right. You probably uh, have conversations all the time about that. In fact, it, this kind of brings me to the next question. And this is a huge pet peeve. Um, I know one of our guests that have been on the, the, the podcast before, Elena Saras, mm -hmm. she left Amazon because of this. She had yeah. a successful brand. Q4 comes around a week before Black Friday. Somebody puts in a fake, a false uh, IP claim. Yep. And then she shut down until the holiday period's over. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this happened two years in a row with her. And she, she oh, that's yeah. where she made most of her sales. Is mm -hmm. there any way to fight that? Is there any way to get your account back quicker than sitting through, you know, six weeks of waiting yes. for Amazon? It's a yes and no. It, I, I know that's not kind of satisfactory. Um, the copyright complaints are at all time high right now. Mm -hmm. So those teams are way backed up. And also you can submit a DMCA counter notice, even with all the evidence in the world, even with a letter from your attorney that says, Hey, this is our copyright. We have our own copyrights to all our text, all our images, whatever has been alleged. Amazon still gives the other party 10 days to respond to your DMCA counter notice. The problem being sometimes they don't notify them right away. So you can't start mentally counting down from 10, um, which 10 days over Black Friday, Cyber Monday, you've oh. already like carpet bombed that entire period. Yeah. But, um, and I kind of regret saying this, you know, now because I know <laughs> um, people are, are already trying it, but it might be even more widespread. People understand that it might take Amazon 10 days just to notify the complainant, the, the complaining party, which means there's 10 days to wait after the 10 days that Amazon waited to notify them. That's 20 days. So going through protocols and channels that Amazon gives you, in theory, you should get that back after 10 days when the other side probably doesn't respond, right? But the other side's doing this so often on so many of their competitors, they probably don't care about responding. They know it's going to take Amazon 21 days just to do the right thing. There are some people that are hiring us for something they shouldn't even have to pay us for, which is it's already been the 10 days since the counter notice. Um, and maybe they even have indication from Amazon teams, maybe even account health reps, whatever, that the other party has been notified and that and it's been way past 10 days. It's been like 14 days. They still didn't get their listing back. They have to do an escalation just to push that team to go back through, locate the date that they notified the other party of your DMCA counter notice and review it properly and make sure that the escalations process and get your listing back to you. That's why people are using copyrights so much right now. So be prepared for that now. I've, I've had some of our clients like start giving us info and getting almost getting like appeals drafted now for when they get attacked, yeah. which inevitably will happen. Patent co complaints, obviously get a patent assessment from, an, from an IP, a real IP attorney, not somebody who's pretending to be an IP attorney. Um, Trademark, you know, we all know what trademark is. Um, make sure you're assessing that validity properly. And then everything else is either, you know, standard IP complaints or counterfeit complaints. The good news is we've seen a decrease in the number of private label brands accused of counterfeiting their own product because that's just so ridiculous to begin with. Um, those, I think, are pretty 
quick on the re on the re replying and appealing and getting those listings back up. So black hats aren't using that as much uh, as an avenue. In the beginning, I think they were just plugging the fake and counterfeit keyword, you know, in as much as possible in the mm -hmm. complaints. That doesn't care, hold as much water or carry as much weight now. Um, so they seem to have backed up. I mean, your group and your listeners can you know, prove me wrong if they want. I'm not seeing that as much as I used to. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just looking at the time. I, yep. This time That's is just everything I had, by. So if you want to do questions. Yeah. I was just going to yeah. say, let's get on to some questions. Man, yeah. oh man, it just flew by. So uh, this will be the last time I'll mention this, that Chris has got this event. It's yep. a awesome event in Boston. Uh, he is giving away uh, a $297 value. Uh, so one free ticket to the event. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're interested, it is uh, hashtag uh, Wheel of Kelsey. Now, Chris, does that also cover, if the person can't make it live, is there going to be a digital recording? Yeah. Every event we've always ever done for Seller Velocity, we've had a virtual, like a live stream. Um, first year we did, it didn't work out so well, but we've changed, you know, tech and strategies and got new people on it. So um, knock on wood, hopefully no issues on the day. But um, yeah, I mean, if the winner is unable to attend because they are too far from Boston or can't travel or, you know, uh, COVID concerns, whatnot. I mean, in Massachusetts, there are mask mandates. So you have to wear a mask to attend the conference. It's on the website for Seller Velocity. Uh, if for any reason you can't work with any of those things, um, we can offer you know a free virtual ticket. And all right. you'll, you'll have access to the lightning talks. Um, we're not recording all of the breakout sessions because it's simply, there'd be too many AV crews required um, and it's not feasible, but you will okay. have access to all the lightning talks. Uh, and you'd have access to, we, we are using the online platform called Circle. It kind of functions like a private Facebook group. Um, you can interact with uh, speakers in there. And so if you have questions for a speaker and you're a virtual attendee and you don't have access to content from their breakout session, um, you can you can ask them any questions you want. Yeah, you've got some great speakers, by the way, too. I know I put a lot of time, by the way, um, especially, you know, your group has a lot of seasoned sellers and, and successful brands. I would love feedback on anything we're doing this year. We're doing different format. We put a lot of time and effort into the speakers themselves. Uh, we're making sure that, um, and I, you know, I'm guilty of this too, in terms of my, my face and my talk on suspended accounts tends to show up um, on a consistent basis in conference land. We're trying to get new faces in front of people as well who are respected experts in their field. And it is an Amazon brand conference, but there will also be people there who are experts in, you know, marketing off Amazon as well. Um, I interviewed Theron Harmon of Harmon Brothers. Yep. And almost everybody's seen one of their uh, advertisements, right? Um, the raw egg on the mattress, purple mattress, is, is one that I remember. Um, but they've had so many successful oh, ads. They're, yeah, the years. they're the yeah. king of those viral videos. I mean, they've got a billion and a half, you know, click-throughs. Or, I mean, um, they've, they've done really, really well for themselves. And it was great to talk to Theron Harmon. Um, he and I have had conversations about a plus content about like Amazon specific stuff, but I made sure that people like him and others who are experts in just how to run a business, right. Or how to be efficient running a business, um, things that all of us, including myself could, could learn that those people will be there speaking as experts as well. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Kels, let's get to some questions. Okay. We got lots coming in, uh, from Faye. I was told not to run PPC ads before having a review, but with absolutely no reviews and no PPC, you're probably get any sales. It's yeah. like what came first, chicken or egg, but how do you get that one or two reviews first um, that are absolutely legal? Yeah, I mean, you should be waiting until you get a real, ver a verified review from an actual buyer. And um, in terms of how many reviews you need to get before you run PPC ads, um, I mean, Norm, how do you answer that question? <laughs> I don't worry about it. I run I mean, the ads. Yeah. I, I, uh, no, I but wanna... if somebody asked you your, your opinion on that. Yeah. I, I would get my PPC up. Yeah. 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 Um, you want to, you don't want to put the cart before the horse mm -hmm. for anything, Amazon. You want to give yourself at least a little bit of time to build up a presence of any kind. Right. If you're brand new, 
I've never been a proponent of the quick launch. I mean, I know this stuff's everywhere in YouTube and, and mm -hmm. elsewhere, but mentally build in some time to, to build up, you know, give yourself a runway to, to get some reviews and build up a little bit of a presence. Yeah. You, um, and you know, going after these, uh, reviews, once you start to get some organic sales or, you know, yeah. from your PPC, it all comes down to that user experience. If you've done your job mm -hmm. and you've got a great user experience, those, you, those, uh, reviews are going to come like the way that we're teaching people how to do it now mm -hmm. is just let it come organically. It's going to yeah. come four to 7%, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that's so much better Then you don't have to worry about it. Um, yeah, there's, there's really no reason why you need to go out and try to get those reviews. I know it like, if, as, uh, I shouldn't say that if you're in a, a very ultra competitive, um, uh, niche, okay. Yeah. It's absolutely going to have a problem, but I right. can show you product launches that we've had just running PPC in competitive, uh, categories mm -hmm. and still getting sales. Yeah. I answer, I've started answering that question. Like, how's your listing optimization? And people will be like, what? And I'm like, well, if you made the product info clearer, you're going to sell it more. Probably right. if there's any confusion on that listing and I'm not a listing optimization expert myself by any means, but I understand the basic concepts. And I think if you're confusing people because you've got poorly written content images, whatever, the listing is not properly optimized. You're, you're hurting your sales, which means there's fewer people that could potentially leave you a positive review. And there's more likely, probably more likely to have people confused by your product who think that the detail page isn't accurate and that they're getting a different product, which presents like the opposite, you know, result. So, mm. yeah. Okay. Uh, from Jessica Rabbit, is a QR code on an insert directing customers to your website allowed? People are still asking for reviews. I should have said this earlier. So there are inserts that are fine. I do see inserts that I don't look at an insert and knee jerk automatically say, this is terrible, get rid of it. There are, there are inserts that are fine. Uh, my question back to Jessica is, are you using the QR code to direct them somewhere, your website, your group, whatever, um, to get some sort of free product and that's gonna translate into a positive product review down the road. Are, you, can, you can offer an 800 number, you can offer customer service related, you know, customer service at mybrand.com. I mean, that's fine. Make sure you're looking at what they get when they, what they see when they get there and imagine you're an Amazon PRA product reviews, abuse investigator following that funnel. Anytime you set up any new sales funnel, uh, think about it from the review or sales rank abuse teams perspective of, are they going to think you're inducing behavior anywhere along that chain? I mean, how, how much do we used to talk about, language in the messaging, right? When people were saying we're a, uh, you know, small family owned business, they were trying to guilt people into leaving positive reviews. Remember that conversation from like two years ago? Yeah. Um, we talked to e-com engine about it all the time. We talked to a lot of people about it. Um, that's kind of gone away, but that's, you got to make sure that same sales funnel experience isn't present in a different way elsewhere in your messaging. Right. Yeah. So. And I think I'm going to know your answer on this, Chris, but uh, should we no longer be using rebates or stick with 80% or less rebated? Yeah, I mean, 80%, um, if anyone sees that you're discounting 80%, it's kind of the same as giving it away. And giveaways lead to, lead to bad times. I mean, Amazon um, won't necessarily come out and make a public statement, you know, by the way, rebates on the back end of an order of a sale um, discounts between 15 and 20% are okay. Discounts between 20 and 80% are, are considered varying degrees of evil. Giveaways are terrible. They're never going to quantify that for you. Um, nobody should, at this point, nobody should be doing 80% discounts. Um, it's just, it's just asking for trouble. And I don't want anyone who's new to this whole conversation to be as surprised as some of the people I talked to this week who were like, I just started. I put all this effort into manufacturing this product into launching this brand. And this is how I end. <laughs> and I'm at the point now where I can't say, well, it's your, 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 your first time offender. So you should be able to fix it. I've like stopped saying that to people. I've been saying that to people for years. 
I don't feel comfortable saying that after this week because of the number of first time offenders who are being completely ignored. And again, not to go back into it, some of them are getting these messages back from account health saying, I don't think you can do this. Wow. And it's like a couple of them, I've joined them on the call with account health and I'll, I'll push them a little bit like, well, why this is a new account or maybe it's not a new account, but it's the first suspension. The problem is if you're brand new and you're suspended within two, three months, because you're doing one of these launches, you don't have this, the track record. You don't have the you know credibility on the street for being a trustworthy seller. So if they think you're new and you're doing it and your answer is, well, we didn't know, or well, ignorance is our excuse. They're like, I don't care what your excuse is. I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, but they're going to be like, we don't trust you with our buyers. And actually we don't trust you to create headaches for us. Never mind our buyers. You're putting our head in the oven when you do that. And you're, you're baking our brains because the government's all over us for this. And the media is pushing them. I mean, the Wall Street Journal doing that article two, what was it, two, three weeks ago, uh, with a lot of like damning information in it. I mean, how many times has the journal covered reviews abuse? Seven, eight, nine? Mm, yeah. In the last three years? I mean, for them to keep coming back to the well, that means Amazon right up to their highest levels of PR, like Jay Carney. Do you think Jay Carney is sick of this product reviews abuse conversation? I don't know him, but I'm pretty sure he is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know Obama either, but Jay Carney worked in the White House. He's worked at Amazon for a long time. He knows what a public black eye that doesn't go away is like. And I'm pretty sure he understands heavy duty responses. And that comes from the top S team level executives. You know how they, um, not to go too far off track, but the buyer seller messaging ban, maybe you've talked about that in this group before. Yeah, we have. You know its origins, where it came from. Um, S team level executives saw messages from buyers complaining that they had thousands of messages from sellers asking for reviews. Back before the quantity thing was so clear about like, just send one message, not mm -hmm. two or three. This is a couple of years ago, maybe. That was an S team level executive who was like, screw this, take anybody who's creating this kind of buy bad buyer experience and punish the hell out of them. That message goes down to the mid-level managers, whatever that are in charge of my former teams. That's a very clear directive, which it only has one answer. What's that answer? Go suspend the hell out of everybody. In fact, the more people you suspend, you're actually, you know, their teams are making that manager or VP's life easier because when that senior VP or S team executive comes knocking on the door next time and says, what did you do about this problem? Two months later, what does that person say? Well, let me show you the 11,000 people we took down. They might not even be asked how many they reinstated. They just say how many they took down as a badge of honor. Hmm. What does that say to us? Clear message. Yep. Sorry for the long-winded answers, but <laughs> at least at least there's clarity, guys. At least yeah, there we go. Beating around the bush or like maybe this, maybe that. This is probably the clearest show I can I can. Chris, do. I've never known you to beat around the bush. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, I have to. It's an obligation. We're paid not to beat around the bush. We're right. paid to be direct with people. So it's not a theoretical conversation. People are relying on us for expertise. If yeah. we don't have it, I mean, they're going to tell you I'm not an expert in that area or I'm going to be giving you an expert answer because that's what you've compensated me for. There's no, <laughs> there's no other point to like, you know, unless we're best buddies and hanging out, having a beer, there's no other point for spending your valuable time on the phone or email with me. So, right. Yeah. Anyway. It's uh, one o'clock. So one I'm more, sure. maybe one, one and a half one more. Okay. Uh, I, I've got, I've got a quick too. one. I, I saw somebody say this about three or yeah, four yeah, times. Yeah, with with that. your expertise, when we talk about high quality uh, seller quality scores, yep. do you know what uh, what some of the categorize or what some of the categories are in there? What yeah. makes up a buyer quality score yeah, or a, I, a seller quality score? Yeah, and it's obviously the algorithms have changed since I left the company. I should start mm -hmm. state that emphatically first, but. Um, metrics matter, order defect rates matter. Um, how many times you've been warned? 
how many notifications or policy violations, how many uh, ASIN level appeals you haven't answered or haven't successfully appealed. That matters. There's many slices, just like for who wins the buy box. That algorithm must be in 17 slices somewhere, right? Okay. Um, similar concept, but not things like rocket science that you wouldn't be able to guess in terms of your metrics are good for a sustained period of time. You haven't been suspended for like account level suspended for a sustained period of time, and you're not drowning in unresolved account health dashboard problems and, and unresolved uh, performance notifications or, you know, policy violations. Because <clears throat> by the way, when you are exiting or thinking of selling your business to an aggregator, they want what Amazon wants, which is a clean bill of health, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same problem. If you haven't successfully appealed those ASINs, guess what those aggregators ask somebody like me running due diligence before they do uh, when they're doing pre-acquisition uh, assessments. Same things that Amazon wants. <laughs> the same questions that account health reps talk to you about when they call you and ask you for a plan of action. They want you to clean up anything you've left, damaged, broken, festering, whatever. It's, it's all the same stuff. So, Okay. Maybe so, one more? Or do you uh, want to wheel it? What's that? Uh, yeah, I can do one more. Okay, one more question, and then we'll cut it and get over to the wheel. Okay, uh, let me see. I'll try and pick one. Uh, I think it's... My one o'clock just moved to two, so we can just keep talking. Oh. <laughs> I mean, if you want. <laughs> I can take a couple more. But, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We had a couple questions about quality score. Uh, what oh, we is just talked score? about that, Kels. Okay. Okay. Yeah, maybe skip listen. To the next listen. <laughs> I'm working He's on reading. it. Uh, He's reading. He's <laughs> reading. Jessica Rabbit, uh, would you agree that Amazon is more afraid of USA prosecution for consumer violations by its sellers than the Chinese black hat sellers? Prosecution, um, maybe a follow-up question back would be, are you talking about product safety complaints? Are you talking about abuse or IP related stuff? There, I'll answer that question this way. Um, they're not as afraid currently evidence supports i can't get too specific they're not as afraid of being sued of course since that winds up in arbitration they're not as afraid of being sued as they are being investigated by government bodies um or having somebody's senator somebody's congressman reach out to them and say what the hell is going on here my you know my constituent again amazon might ignore you till the cows come home if you're a constituent in someone's con congressional district you've got every right to reach out to them, even if it's considered a private business dispute or an you know, economic issue to an extent that, that involves your business and not your, your civil rights or something to that effect. You can reach out to your congressman, congresswoman and say, these guys are holding my money. They, they haven't justified why. These guys have um, you know, cheerfully accepted a bogus IP complaint, which has crippled my business and keeps my inventory stuck there that can't be sold and they won't explain why. We followed all their protocol protocols for any process, even for, hey, let's say you're reporting rampant reviews abuse by a competitor and Amazon's totally ignoring you. That still, that still happens as eager as they are to enforce reviews abuse, that happens all the time. You have other places you can go. You don't have to just sit at home waiting for Amazon to maybe feel like emailing you. Um, if they're going to completely ignore you, we're hearing sellers that are contacting congressional reps sometimes they're one of their two u.s senators some of them are going directly to the ftc um there are logical reasons for this <laughs> so i think that's what amazon's really worried about is consistently hearing again from consumer agencies governmental bodies congressional committees congressional representatives um, Amazon wouldn't have an office for congressional affairs in Washington, D.C. if they weren't worried about that or if they weren't interested in taking those complaints seriously. So what happens in China with a Chinese based business? There's only so much you can do as a seller. There's only so much Amazon can do as a company. Um, but if you're based in the U.S. and you're getting rampant attacks from a Chinese competitor, I don't think you should give up, throw up your hands. I think you should voice those concerns anywhere you've got a forum where proper action can be considered if not taken. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, uh, from Usman, in terms of uh, what the situation is right now, is SFB traceable by Amazon as well nowadays uh, by doing managed SFB with slow review buildup rather than quick reviews? Um, what what definition are we using for uh, traceable? Traceable how? What what's the what's the funnel that's being used there? Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure. sure. I'm, I, I need a bit more specifics there. Yeah. So Usman, if you could slow get review build up versus quick reviews, um, versus managed, what do you mean by managed SFB? Uh, external. Uh, external. Yeah. Um, if you want to show me, maybe it's quicker, just show me an example. You can always email me. I mean, is that cool or yeah. By the way, if there are any questions that aren't answered, I can just throw out my email address if you want. A absolutely. Yeah, that would be just, fantastic. I mean, given the time of year, it's usually better to get quick answers. It's Chris, C-H-R-I-S, at ecommercechris.com. When you go to ecommerce, Chris, you still get the contact form. You can put whatever you want in there. There's several of us that see it. But um, anyone, just put in your subject line like I was on Norm, you know, lunch with Norm, um, and I'll see it and respond. If I don't respond today, I'll respond Monday. All right. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Okay, great. I got time uh, for one more. Yeah. Okay, one more question. Okay, I'm selling a bundle of pieces, uh, products recently. I put one complementary product in the bundle. So can I add the complementary product in my title and image listings? Is it allowed in Amazon policies? Depends on how it's done. Maybe he can, that's another one, email me an example. I should look at the images. Yeah. Yeah, it really depends on what you're saying in that title too. What you're saying in the title, the image, the nature of the image, yeah, yeah how it's portrayed. Yeah. Um, okay. Most sellers don't do bundles right, by the way. I've learned from uh, Yes, that's <laughs> absolutely <laughs> correct. And Norm and I have discussed this at length. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah. that's it. Let's get to the wheel. Of Let's Kelsey. do the wheel. All right, it's time for the wheel. And of course, we didn't get to any questions too. If you have questions for Norm, as well, you can always post in the Facebook group, uh, Lunch with Norm, Amazon FBA, and e-commerce e collective. And here we go. It's time for the wheel. It's time for the wheel of health. All right. All right. Wow, a whack intro. of people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to shuffle these up. And yep. here we go. Three, two, one. Good luck, so if everybody. If you are the winner, please email me at k at lunchwithnorm.com. Who got okay. it? Who Jahan got Zeb. it? Who got it? Jahan Zeb. Zeb. All right. Well, congratulations. I think you're a first time winner. Uh, uh, no, he's won before. Oh, uh, has he? Wow. Yep, yep definitely. Very so, good. Uh, Lucky wheel. <laughs> There we go. Yeah. So that's a great, I mean, you're going to love this event. There's uh, Kelsey, you'll make sure that uh, you'll get the information uh, so they can go over to the event site, see yeah. the speakers. Uh, they're amazing. So, and if, if anybody does want to attend the, um, uh, the event as well, I think the code is just norms rock norm rocks. Norm rocks. There norm we go. Rocks. Yep. And you'll get an extra 10% uh, off. Yeah. So, all right, Mr. So Chris, much. Thank you so much for coming yes. on. Um, can't wait to have you back on. Let's do it again in Q4. All right. That's definitely will. Okay. We'll see you later. You. All right, everybody. So thank you for joining us today. That was fantastic. The time flew by. By the time I looked up, it was already quarter to uh, one. And, and Chris stayed an extra you know, 10 minutes for us. So that's fantastic. Uh, Kelsey, who do we got on uh, on Monday? We have Adrian Savage. He's a new guest. Um, yep. He's going to be talking about uh, email marketing, how to stay out of the spam box, and oh, uh, great. all those different techniques. Yeah, I remember yeah. talking about, uh, to you about this. So that's something that's so important that we don't utilize enough is just uh, working with email marketing. The strategies are still there. They're still opening. It's uh, If you remember the uh, information that Ben Leonard gave us, I mean, Look at that's his number one way of uh, uh, getting people 
uh, to buy his product. So anyways, uh, that'll be fantastic. That's Monday. I wanted to give a big thank you out uh, to our sponsor of this episode, uh, and that's Global Wired Advisors, a leading digital investment bank focused on optimizing the business sales process. For more information, call Chris and his team at globalwiredadvisors.com. All right, Kels, what else do we need? All right, so I just want to give a big thanks to everyone. Again, I see a bunch of new people joining us on the show, so that's awesome to see. And uh, yeah, if you are new to the show, we go live every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 12 o'clock uh, p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so it's a time where you can just throw in your questions for the guest. We usually try and answer questions around the topic um, just so the guest can have uh, input as well. But um, yeah, if you have any questions for Norm or I or anyone in our group, go over to our Facebook group, Lunch with Norm, Amazon FBA and e-commerce collective and uh, someone in the community, I'm sure we'll get back to you. Also, if you have any, if you just want to get to know the community, it's a great place for that as well. And if you've missed today's episode, you can go over to our YouTube channel, Norman Ferrar. Um, it's been growing and growing, so it's been great to see. But we've got our, all of our episodes there, our daily highlights. And uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Okay. Um, if you're interested in some uh What are you, you keep membership. talking? You said it was it. Now, now you're continuing so to talk. I think it's it. But uh, okay, no, 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 I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> okay, good. So let's see. Other way. Get out of here. There. All right. So if we haven't talked about it too much, but uh, if you're looking at uh, some free information about selling on Walmart, uh, go to our our other YouTube channel called uh, Private Label Legion, and you'll see a hit list of six different high quality, very good inf uh, good videos about how to sell on Walmart. The application process, which is tricky. The, uh, the appeals process, getting started, what to expect, what not to expect. Anyway, anyway, there's six free videos there that you can take a look at. And now, uh, I know that Kelsey already stole this line from me, but join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at noon Eastern Standard Time. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you for being part of the community. And have a great weekend. We'll see you next time. Lunch with the lunch with the lunch